second lesson is Philippians 1, 3 to 11, on page 196, and this is where Paul writes, I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you, because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you because you hold me in your heart. For all of you share in God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to determine what is best so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. The word of the Lord. So in our readings today, you know, we heard of Jacob wrestled with God, came out with a new name and a new calling. And we wrestle with God a lot. We listen for the story of God's call in our lives and wonder what it's to be. And Paul writes to these Philippians, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. So who is it that begins the good work among us? It's God. The same God whom Paul served, the same God with whom Jacob wrestled. And God began a good work here among the people of Newton. And God will continue that work until the day is fulfilled and the time is right. We are rich in history and rich in these promises of God. Now if you read the history of this congregation, you'll see some interesting things. And I would recommend to you this book. It's the history of the congregation that was prepared in 2008. If you don't have a copy, ask me. Well, there are copies. I think we've got 3,000 of them in a box somewhere. We have plenty. We'll get you one to read. It's an interesting book. You see, a small group of people met in a living room down the street on June 17, 1858. Eight people started this congregation, and I wonder if those eight people would even recognize the congregation today. In their wildest dreams, would they have imagined that anything like this would come to pass? Now, there was already a Reformed church in town in 1858, and lots of Lutherans. <laughs> and they're okay, we like Lutherans. But these staunch Presbyterians stuck together. And the congregation survived. It survived through several economic downturns. It survived through the Civil War, what Granny Clampett called the War of Yankee Aggression. I like to call it the recent unpleasantness. But they survived that in a town that wasn't supposed to survive. Newton is built in the wrong place. The railroad didn't even come here. How in the world would the town survive? We don't mind, said the Presbyterians. And it didn't stop us. Now for a lot of years, the session consisted of the minister and one elder. Some years later, three more elders were elected. And I think you were elected for life. Now some of you have formed an impression of the service of elder because of an experience you had on the session some years back and you don't ever want to talk about it again. You don't ever want to see the session again. Let me 
me tell you, we have a good session. And we have meaningful discussions that we move us that move us forward. So I promise you the session is different now than it was some years back. You'd probably like it. So if you get asked, think about that. Well anyway, so for years the session was small. The congregation was small too. There were about 30 members. Preaching was maybe once a month. And how would this little church survive? Well, against all odds, it did survive and it began to thrive. There may not have been many people in the congregation, but the ones who were here were committed. And after 20 years or so, they decided it was time to build a church, and they built what we call the chapel. D.B. Gaither was one of the early members of the church, and he sold the church the land that the chapel sits on. The men built the outside, and the women finished the insides. And at a certain point, there was a shortage of funds. So one of the women, Mrs. Helen Schlegel, wrote a wholesaler in New York that her family did business with and explained that they needed to make up the difference for the building of this little church in Newton, North Carolina. Well, it happened that the president of that company had met Robert Anderson at Princeton University, and Robert Anderson was now preaching here, and he was so impressed that he said Anderson $50, which was a lot of money in 1877. And so on November 17th, the congregation moved into its brand new chapel and began to worship there. Now the women had formed the Ladies Aid Society like the second week of the congregation's existence in 1858. And in 1887, it was time for the first wedding. In the chapel, the daughter of Mrs. Schlegel and so the women decided that they would buy new carpet and that every woman would give a dollar. This was a requirement. It nearly split the church and the Ladies Aid Society was inactive for some time after that. But the carpet was, pur was purchased, you know, so. So in the first 50 years of this congregation's life, what we see as we read this book is people who are, you know, they're just acting like people. They're helping each other and they're disagreeing about things. But in all of it and through all of it, God is faithfully acting and God preserves his church. Now one of the women was Fanny Williams. And she said, for many years a man has held the position but women have done the work. You know, we're still fighting that battle. <laughs> but God is with us and God works in us and through us. So the little congregation grew slowly over the years and in the 40s added, you know, the Boy Scout wing out back. And that was the Fry wing named after William Fry, who was a longtime leader in the congregation. Almost forgotten these days, I think. One young man who grew up in this church, the first Eagle Scout, was Andrew Rader. And he went to medical school, became a physician. When World War II started, he became an army doctor. He was sent to the Philippines and he was among the thousands that were captured on the Philippines by the Japanese. So he spent several years fighting with the Japanese to treat the prisoners better. He endured a lot of beatings and hardship. And at a certain point they loaded thousands of these prisoners onto a troop ship to move them. And of course the Allies torpedoed the troop ship and killed a lot of these prisoners and he was killed in that sinking. So after the war the army named a clinic at Fort Myer which is in Virginia near the Pentagon 
after him, and he was the only Newton Presbyterian to die in World War II. So as we move the story closer to our own time, and we read the names of people we recall, some of you will remember Dr. Joseph Carter, who came here, who was pastor here from 45 to 1956. He led the congregation through a lot of expansion and growth. He had a passion for evangelism. He was a good preacher. He had a pastor's heart. And there are plaques in both entrances to the chapel remembering Dr. Carter. And after Dr. Carter, there was Bob Bloomer. And he was a young man with lots of little kids, lots of laundry. And he led the church through its years of continuing growth. As I said, my first Sunday here last year, I met him several times along the way. He was a great man. Others of you may recall Reverend Charles Parrish. He was only here for a year. He was remembered chiefly for, without consulting any of the leaders, tearing the ivy off of the chapel. This was not a popular achievement. <laughs> he was asked to leave. So let's fast forward to the 80s. <laughs> you had a bunch more pastors, and then in the 80s, Charlie Durham. And when he was here, the funds were raised to build the fellowship hall and the kitchen. And now stop and think how much was done for so long without a fellowship hall in a kitchen. And then think again, how much have we been able to do in the last 30 years because of that fellowship hall? Thanks be to God for the work of Charlie Durham. And you remember Jody Welker and Cynthia Williams. And some pastors of former years we remember by name for this or that. Some pastors we knew and loved. And we give thanks for all of their work among us, especially for the construction of this sanctuary and this education building. You know, it is not easy to shepherd a committee through a process like that. Hats off to them. And all the way along, from the first eight people in 1858 until now, God has been leading the people here and the pastors here through good times and bad, faithfully, so that the Presbyterian presence in town will be strong. In 1922, the newspaper claimed that the town had 600 Methodists, 300 Baptists, 220 Reformed, 200 Lutherans, and 150 Presbyterians. But though small in numbers, no congregation in town is, so faith, is as faithful to its denomination and the institutions of the church. So over all those years, there were hardly more Presbyterians in town than there are now. But the people who did worship here were leaders in the town and leaders in the church. And we are the heirs to a legacy of very faithful people. Now I think about the way that time passes in a congregation kind of like this. You know, we all knew Tom Warlick. And we all knew, we all know Al Gaither. They played together when they were small boys. And in those days, the very oldest people in the church would have remembered the charter members. Tom Warlick's great-grandparents were among the first eight who gathered. So there's a connection there from us to those early people. And there's, you turn it around, Tom and Al and some of us see these young, young children, the smallest ones among us, and when those people are elderly, they will know small children. And so the memories of Tom and Al and all of us will be cherished for years and years to come. 
There is a long chain of faithful witnesses, and we are a part of it. A parade that stretches back to the earliest days of this country, to the Reformation in Scotland, and on back to the early church. So we're tied together over time. And it's not only time that connects us, but the Spirit of God. These people read the same scriptures, they prayed the Lord's Prayer, they sang many of the same hymns that we do. The people worship God just as we do. And today we can use Calvin's liturgy from Strasbourg and Geneva, and it's not really terribly different from our own regular liturgy. His was in French, but aside from that, you know, it's not that different. So just to tie together some of what we're doing here today, we celebrate the Reformation on the last Sunday of October because on October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther posted his 95 theses for debate on the door of the church in Wittenberg. His 95 theses for debate were not anything you would find earth-shaking. They're as boring and as philosophically obscure as anything you ever could read. But this is what he wanted to talk about. And somehow when he did that, it sparked a change. Luther objected to seeing the Mass as a sacrifice of Jesus anew every week. He objected to saying the Mass in Latin and not in German in Germany. And he objected to the practice of serving the people the bread, but not the wine at communion. So he wanted to worship in German so that people could understand what was being said. And he had a different theological understanding of the sacrifice of Christ. And he gave communion to the ordinary people in the bread and the wine. And believe it or not, those were radical proposals. And the printing press was fairly due in those days and ideas could be rapidly shared. And so a French law student named John Calvin was converted and he went to Switzerland and he began to run the church there and his ideas were a little different from Luther's but pretty much the same and he uh, he said that scripture should only only scripture should be used as an authority for doctrine in church practice and he taught many other pastors and he taught John Knox, who then went back to Scotland, where he was from, and converted the Scottish church. And that is what is called the Presbyterian church, and here we are. So we remember today that heritage. We recall those who've died. November 1st is also All Saints Day, when the church remembers those who've gone before. And today we also honor those who've been members for 50 years or more. Those who've gone before us have had a great hand in shaping who we are, what we do, in shaping our faith and our practice. And so we remember them and give them honor. I worked with a pastor one time who said, yeah, you know, most of the time when they write a church's history, it's a list of pastors and when they, wrote, when they built the buildings which is exactly what no one cares about. And if you read this history book, you'll see a lot more than just that. History is much richer than those sorts of lists. And so all of this history and all of this tradition, it all points us to stewardship. It points us to the future. We are the result we are the fruit of many years of faithful service by those who have gone before us. And little or great, each one of them made a contribution to the life of this congregation. Each one of them contrib contributed something to who we are. And I hope that we, each one of us, can in turn make our own contribution in some way to this body, to who it is, and who we hope it will become. 
So this week, think about the past. Think about those in whatever time or place whose ministry has affected who you are. And think about those whose names you don't know, yet whose faith and work led to the faith being passed on to you. Think about all those people and give thanks for them. And think about how God has brought the world along to this point and placed you in it in this particular place so that you can do your part for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Think about what part, what that task, what that calling is and be ready to step up and do your part in response to the call of God's Spirit in your life. Thanks be to God. Amen.